On Thursday, December 30th, 2021, the communities in and around Boulder County, Colorado, experienced what is to date the most destructive fire in the state's history. While the area was accustomed to dry conditions, high winds, and even wildfires, the unpredictability and devastation of the Marshall Fire was unprecedented. This fire, which started as a wildfire but rapidly evolved into an urban conflagration, was fueled by extremely dry vegetation and wind gusts that reached 115 miles per hour. It burned everything in its path as it jumped over a six-lane highway with ease. Entire subdivisions were decimated despite the heroic efforts of hundreds, if not thousands, of emergency personnel. Approximately 35,000 individuals were evacuated from their homes with little to no time to grab personal belongings. The fire also threatened a number of residential care facilities and hospitals, forcing them to evacuate vulnerable and critically sick patients into a healthcare system that was already incredibly stressed due to the COVID-19 Omicron surge and staffing shortages. The following day, New Year's Eve, as snow fell from the sky, the community was able to take in the full impact of the Marshall Fire. Just over 6,000 acres had burned with 1,084 homes destroyed and 159 structures damaged. While the damage assessment and recovery process is ongoing, it is estimated that the fire caused more than $2 billion in losses. Remarkably, there were no serious injuries to first responders. However, tragically, two members of the community did lose their lives. The communities that were impacted by this historic event continue to recover and rebuild their lives. And while those first responders and healthcare workers who worked tirelessly to protect their communities are working to heal and recover, they also recognize the importance of sharing their stories and learning from this incident so that they and others can be better prepared to respond and save lives. This four-part Marshall Fire Learning Series brings the stories from fire and EMS responders, the hospital evacuation team, residential communities evacuations, and the efforts provided for regional coordination. Hello, and welcome to the Marshall Fire Learning Series. Um, we're assembled here today to discuss the hospital and EMS response to this very significant event in our community. My name is Abigail Blackmore. I'm the Director of Trauma and EMS Outreach for Good Samaritan Medical Center, and I served as the Operations Section Chief for our Incident Command Team. I'd like to go down the, the table here and allow everyone to introduce themselves. My name is Mark Dougherty. I'm the EMS Chief for North Metro Fire Rescue. During the day of the fire, I served as the uh, EMS liaison or EMS command of uh, the Avista evacuation and the evacuation of Good Samaritan. Hi, I'm Robert Frakes. I, um, I was involved at the Good Samaritan Hospital during this event. Um, my role in this event was the transportation officer um, at Good Samaritan Hospital. And I'm Jason Rosa. I'm the EMS medical director for North Metro Fire Department. Uh, I assisted Mark uh, at Good Samaritan Hospital to help evacuate uh, primarily the ICU was what we spent most of our time with with specialized transport that day. And I'm Paul Johnson. Most everybody knows me as PJ. Uh, I'm the Division Chief of EMS for Mountain View Fire. Uh, and on the day of the event, uh, the Marshall Fire, I was serving as the Division Supervisor for Division Zulu, or what became Division Zulu. Um, and that had the hospitals in it. So it had a Vista Hospital and it had uh, Good Samaritan in it. Um, so on the day of the fire, uh, the, the fire began, you know, around 11 o'clock and, and for the purposes of the evacuation, by the time it had progressed around, uh, it, it, went, it went straight across Highway 36, and, uh, which is a major probably seven or eight lane uh, freeway, lots of concrete. Uh, the fire jumped across that very quickly. Uh, there was a massive smoke and ash plume. Uh, there was uh, huge amounts of debris burning firebrands and embers. Uh, blowing through the air and I was contacted uh, on my division and told that uh, a Vista was being impacted by smoke and were, was concerned about the fire um, and that they were considering evacuation. Uh, my initial thought was uh, it's a very stout building made of non-combustible material and that it would probably we'd be able to easily defend it um, from a firefighting perspective. 
Um, and I said, you know, I don't think that evacuating Vista is probably the right thing to do right now. Um, and then a short while later, I got a call back and they said, hey, uh, you know, the, uh, the emergency management person over to Vista, Chris Malliard, is requesting evacuation. Um, they're being heavily impacted by smoke and knowing Chris and having worked with him and Chief Doherty and a few others on um, recent exercises and just having that trust and relationship in him, I said, okay, um, looks like we're going to evacuate a Vista. Um, at which point, uh, you know, it became a logistical exercise of how many resources do we need? What kind do we need? Um, and I began trying to order the resources that Chris had requested um, through the incident command. Um, it was around that same time, I think, that I contacted uh, Chief Doherty, or he contacted me and said he was in the area. Um, and I said, you know, hey, would, would you be willing to go over to Avista and uh, take command over there and kind of head up the evacuation? Um, so I sent him over there as, you know, what we termed the hospital liaison, but um, in, in the fire world, I, I called him Avista Command. Um, and so I sent him over there to size up the situation and to be in charge. I talked to PJ and it was it was the same sort of initial thought that I had that, that he had had. This is a Vista is a it's not a big hospital, but it's certainly a concrete hospital. Um, and the idea that this this fire is actually going to burn down the hospital just seemed seemed unrealistic. It seemed much better for the hospital to just to shelter in place. Yeah. So we, it seemed much more realistic that the uh, the hospital would shelter in place as opposed to evacuate. Um, but in talking to PJ and knowing that we needed some sort of situational awareness, I happened to be in the area because my house is is right there. It's about a mile away from Avista. So I had just left my own home, um, getting my wife and my daughters out of the house and our dog. And uh, it was pretty clear that the fire was bad, but the idea that evacuating it, we needed more, we needed more information. So I drove over to the hospital um, and my drive was pretty significant. So I was, I was on McCaslin and I'm in basically just a blackout condition. It's like a whiteout from snow, but, but there was so much smoke um, and actually quite a bit of heat too, that it was difficult to see where we were going. There's a lot of traffic um, and I was you know, driving in opposing lanes of traffic, trying to get to the hospital while everybody else is trying to evacuate the area. And arriving at Avista, it was, it was clearly evident, even before I talked to, to Chris Malliard, it was evident that the, the hospital wasn't um, at threat of being burned down at that point. It was at threat of uh, being basically overtaken by smoke. Um, and the idea that the air handlers for the facility could manage all of that just seemed unrealistic too. So initially walking up, seeing Chris and having a conversation of, hey, what do you think? And it wasn't even a, a second before he said, we need to evacuate, can you help us? Um, and from uh, that point forward, it was, it was mostly my transition of, okay, how can I best assist this evacuation? Um, you know, the, the idea that this is a fire in Boulder County, it's being managed by an incident command in Boulder County, and my agency, North Metro, is one county away. Um, that made it a little bit of a unique situation, and which ended up being a very good thing. Um, but uh, initially thinking, how do I get in communication with Boulder, Boulder to uh, see what resources are available, what resources are coming, um, seeing what Chris has already done resource-wise, what has he ordered, who has he ordered those resources through, and then also getting back in communication with PJ to understand um, what is my role now, what, how am I working under, you know, who's the boss, what, uh, what command structure are we using here? So I think I called PJ back and said, yeah, we're evacuating. Um, what have you done? Something like that. And I don't even know what the, the conversation was from there of um, if you knew the resources, if you knew what was coming, I don't remember. Yeah, uh, at that point there was, uh, there was no resources coming. I, I, you know, I had made the request through incident command and basically gotten word that they were not gonna be able to fill those requests anytime soon. Um, and so, you know, I began kind of trying to coordinate alternate uh, means of resource ordering. Um, I think I, I contacted uh, Michelle Dillon with the Healthcare Coalition and said, hey, we're going to need a resource uh, order. You know, can you put out a, put out a, what, we, what we call EM Resource. EM Resource is the, is the web-based system that the state uses to monitor hospitals and statuses. And you can also use it in a mass casualty incident to uh, request ambulances and resources. And um, so I knew Michelle would be able to handle that. So I contacted her and just said, hey, we need, you know, we need some help ordering ambulances. Um, and got her involved in the ordering, and then uh, told her that uh, Chief Doherty was over to Vista and kind of passed her off to him so that they could handle that, um, you know, mostly because I had other fire duties going on at the same time. 
Um, but I wanted to make sure that, you know, Mark was getting the resources he requested. So I think I let him know, hey, you know, we're not getting anything from, you know, through the incident and the normal chains. Here's, you know, here's the next uh, plan and uh, made sure he was tied in with Michelle. And then, you know, and then kind of just let him take it from there. The one thing I would say about the, the fire um, and it, this fire really changed how or how I thought about fire and what I considered uh, you know, to be something that you would have to evacuate a hospital for. Um, we talked about the smoke, but I mean, keep in mind, and we, and then we covered this in the firefighting series yesterday, um, on video, but you know, there was two by fours that were on fire blowing through the air and shingles and large fire brands just, you know, ripping through the air, at, at, you know, with some of the wind gusts that were clocked at 115 miles an hour. And, you know, it's, it's hard to consider that, but, you know, it only takes one broken window to, to burn down a building as we saw in other places on the fire. And, and then the smoke, like just the sheer volume of smoke. Um, I remember when I got to a Vista, I walked in and saw how much ash and soot was on the floor in the emergency room. I mean, it was truly shocking. So it really changed my mind on, on what, um, you know, what, or when you might need to evacuate a hospital and what's causing it. So, yeah, I think really getting getting over there and seeing what was going on firsthand, you know, definitely helped us understand the situation. And, and then having that relationship and trust in in uh, Chris Malliard um, just kind of helped speed things along. So, yeah, so that's I kind of got started getting resources for Mark and then turned turned it over to him um, and said, hey, if you have other requests, let me know. But yeah, they, there you go. so I, when I walked inside, Chris had Chris had a list of what he needed. He, he had he had an idea of, of the patient count in the hospital. So what's the census? And there were 51 people in the hospital at that time, um, and we knew that about 30 of them were going to need an ambulance transport. He had ordered a certain set of ambulances through Boulder County through through the incident command, um, which included CCT ambulances, so critical care transport. ALS ambulances, advanced life support, life support transports, and then basic life support, so BLS. Um, and there was a, a certain number that he believed we needed ambulance-wise to do that. And I saw this list, and I asked him, you know, where are they coming from? What's their ETA? When are we gonna When are we gonna see them? And he said, I don't know. I don't know that they're coming. Um, and at that point, it was like, okay, well, I, I can either kind of depend on this structure that we don't know really exists. We know that the dispatch centers are overwhelmed. We know the incident command is just trying to get spun up and is definitely not in a position to truly support this evacuation. It's basically its own little incident within this bigger incident. Um, and how am I going to address this? So I made the decision to contact my own dispatch center in Broomfield. So the city and county of Broomfield has a dispatch center for fire and police dispatch. Um, and in doing so, it was actually difficult. Um, even though uh, my set of resources had not been committed all that much to the fire yet, we had a couple of fire engines that were on the fire itself. Um, but even then, I still was struggling to get out because of radio traffic, because of the lack of ability for 800 megahertz radios to communicate. So um, trying to key up my radio just to talk to my own dispatch center, it was taking three or four key ups to actually get a response from the dispatch center. Um, I ended up just calling them on the cell phone. Um, that was a clear path of communication. And I requested that they send as many ambulances, medic units as we call them, so fire-based uh, fire based ambulances to the hospital to assist in the evacuation as possible. Um, they thought that they could send five based on what they could see for our resources from the north area, um, including some of, uh, some of Adams County and some of Broomfield County. Um, and then I also asked for one single fire engine to assist with this. And again, as PJ just said, that, you know, the, the idea that the building was gonna burn down was definitely something on my mind, but it wasn't at the forefront based on where I thought the fire was and the ability for it to jump the freeway. Um, although I, I had, I've seen that in my own experience in California, I didn't expect it again, I guess. It was that same, everybody was in that same sort of underestimation of the, the progression, the speed, um, the severity, and even myself having experienced it in large volume fire in California, I still wasn't expecting it, I guess. Um, so not really thinking I need fire resources to defend the, the hospital at that point. Definitely something in retrospect, I would have sped up. I would have asked for ambulances, but I would have also asked for more fire engines earlier. Um, the, the dispatch center um, sent as many ambulances as they could, and we actually saw our first ambulance arrive, our first medic unit. Um, I think it was 
under 10 minutes, if I believe in what I remember. Um, so it was much quicker to request that from, an in, from a dispatch center that was not encumbered by this incident. Um, they're not taking all of the 911 calls that Boulder County is. They're not dealing with all of the other evacuations that are going on. They're essentially just a separate dispatch center with a separate set of resources that has not been allocated. Um, that really did seem uh, you know, greatly beneficial to, to call, make an, a typical request, and have a medic unit show up very quickly. Um, and the, the, other, the other side of this is um, Carolyn Frazier, who's one of the, the nurses at Avista. Um, she was the charge nurse that day. So she's working with Chris Malliard and the internal process of the hospital to ensure that the, the hospital is getting triaged. So all of these, these 30 patients that we need to get out, they're being triaged to which ones are gonna go first, right? There's, there's now a medic unit outside. Who do we send and where do we send them? Um, it was, uh, you know, you look at a hospital and you think, what, where are the most critical patients? they're probably the ones that are going, going to need to go first, especially if you have a building that's filling up with smoke um, or potentially filling up with smoke. Um, so then you look at the critical patients in the hospital and you think of babies, the critical babies in the ICU, the NICU, the neonatal intensive care unit. Um, so there were five neonatal intensive care patients in the hospital, babies, um, and four of them, I believe, I can't remember, PJ, you remember four or three? Four, um, four of them went in the first transport. So on a typical day, you don't put four NICU patients in an ambulance. Oh, no, it was three, sorry. Three, three, yeah, was it three? Okay, three and one, yeah, three and one. yeah. okay. So, um, uh, so uh, when you look at the ICU, we had five NICU babies. Well, three of them went in the first medic unit off of the property. Um, and on a typical day, you don't put three NICU patients in an ambulance. That's not, a, not truly a safe way of transporting. It's, it's difficult to transport one NICU baby um, safely, let alone two, let alone three, but today was, was nothing but normal. Um, and it was, it was absolutely necessary to move people as quickly as we could. So we put three patients, three NICU babies in this ambulance with nursing staff from the hospital. So definitely another win was not only the, um, uh, the ability to send staff from the hospital, but the willingness of the staff to say, this is the responsibility, this is my responsibility right now. And I'm sure some of these nurses that got in the ambulance to go to a different hospital, I'm sure some of them lived in the area. I'm sure some of them had concerns about their own family, their children, their pets, their, their own belongings. And none of that seemed to matter, right? That It was more about taking care of the thing in front of them, um, which was their patient, that NICU baby. Um, they, they immediately got in that medic unit and we got them off the property as soon as we could. Um, those three went to St. Anthony's North, which is a sister hospital in the same Centura system, um, to Avista. And uh, that, that played a role a little bit later as we started um, sending a lot of patients to that singular hospital. Um, but it went from NICU to uh, the ICU and then um, emergency room patients and, and floor patients. Yeah, one thing to note, I mean, talking about those nurses, you know, I mean, it was fairly impressive at this point. I mean, you know, a large part of the parking lot was on fire. You know, all of the islands that are in between the, you know, in between the roads were on fire, the bushes are on fire. I mean, you know, you're starting to see, you know, bushes outside the hospital burn. Um, you know, I mean, the fire was, was coming through and the, and the nurses were, you know, just piling into their, into the ambulances and focused on the babies and you know, getting, taking care of the patients and, and not, you know, I mean, they didn't know if their car was going to be there when they would come back. And I mean, it was, it, and, you know, plus the 100 mile an hour wind. I mean, it was, it was fairly intense situation. And PJ, a question that I had um, for you, because obviously this fire was in your district when it started. And I, you know, I can certainly attest to having just made note out of my windows to how windy and dusty it was, not realizing that was smoke when we were watching from Lafayette. Um, but that decision to call Mark, was that outside of incident command and you just sort of knew, we talk a lot about this, like you just sort of know your resources in your community? I think I called PJ. Was so that, I, was I, it originated I, from? I'd left my house and I, and I turned on to McCaslin and I was trying to figure out how to help because I was, you know, I'm in my own like emergency response vehicle and I drove past a Mountain View truck. And I went, oh, PJ works here. Maybe somebody should call PJ. <laughs> so I called PJ and was like, hey, man, can I help? And at the point, I don't think you had anything for me. You're like, hey, I'll let you know. Okay, yeah. Um, that something right. like that. And then you yeah. called me back and we're like, oh, this makes sense. Yeah. Oh, by but, the way, yeah. can you go back and read this whole yeah. hospital for me? Thank yeah. You. <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, I think that, that sounds right. It's, yeah. it's, yeah, it's hard to remember the, like, mm -hmm. the exact order of the events of how it all got spun up. But yeah, that, that sounds right. Um, but, you know, I mean, the, the thing of it was, was, I mean, there was just so much smoke and flame. And I mean, 
you couldn't, the problem was you couldn't really see the flame. I mean, it was just so much smoke and ash and dirt, and it was very hard to tell like where the fire was um, because it was moving so quickly and in, you know, in fingers and shoots, like it would shoot off in one direction and then, you know, it kind of come back and burn off when the wind would change a little bit and it would burn again and you'd get reburns. And um, yeah, it, it was truly shocking how fast it went across that, uh, went across the freeway. Um, and just, you know, it made it really challenging to start to figure out. But to answer your question more directly, I mean, yes, I do know what the resources are. And, and we've been working a lot on this, you know, we were calling it the EMS liaison. I mean, yeah. EMS liaison isn't isn't a true ICS term mm -hmm. because liaisons don't do operations. So you know, we're considering changing mm -hmm. the name. But we'd worked on this concept of of a liaison person to go over to the hospitals and tie in with yeah. the hospital incident command and um, and help coordinate you know hospitals and to basically tie the incident in with the with the hospital and be able to get information flowing both directions. And so, you know, having having worked on that through kind of through the auspices of, of mass casualty incident mm -hmm. response. Um, it seemed like a very good position to put Mark into. And, and that's sort of the role he served mm -hmm. that I know we're working on developing, you know, I think more concretely, mm -hmm. but yeah. effectively that's sort of the, how, how Mark functioned during that fire yeah. rapidly. Yeah, and, and, and within our region right now, we are, we are, you know, that was one of the big lessons that came out of this fire was how important that position is. And so, you know, we are working on making it a true, like, operational position. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, you know, for incidents just like this. And so, yeah, it was, it was extremely beneficial to have, you know, uh, somebody of, of Mark's caliber who's an experienced EMS chief, knows the resources, um, and, you know, is close by, uh, you know, and just being able to just put him in there and, and say, have at it, you know, yeah. <laughs> was, it was, a, it was, it was uh, uh, yeah, it was a big win for me that day because, you know, also managing other fire aspects of the fire, you know, I certainly didn't have the, the bandwidth to be able to go over there and deal with that, so. And I think it was at that point in time, after we had heard, we had stood up incident command when we realized that a fire had broken out in the area with the high winds and um, our incident command had stood up. And just to remind everyone, we'd had a rolling incident command that had been going on for months related to our COVID response. But this was really the first time we had to stand up an actual everyone into the incident command center um, very rapidly, as to your point, it had been spreading and once it jumped 36 and we had gotten word of what was happening at Avista, then it got real. Mm -hmm. um, and that uh, leadership, Tony Green Cheatwood, who was um, functioning in the role, and actually she, a lot of our senior leaders were not in house, you know, cause this was in between the holidays. So it was sort of a, you know, yeah, it was Desert, weird. I mean, yeah, it's you know, December 30th. Of, I mean, yeah, nobody's around. Leaders, it's you know, the middle of winter. Exactly. Like, yeah, you don't expect And to. so we're calling up the, we called up our incident command team, got sort of everyone in position, realized what was going on, um, which was a first really for us outside of a, a COVID, rolling COVID incident management response. Um, and so we quickly realized that this was serious, that the, the winds were picking up, that it had jumped, that they had evacuated a vista. And that was essentially when our incident commander, uh, Tony Green Sheetwood, made the decision that we were going to evacuate mm -hmm. um, as well. <clears throat> yeah. I wanted to mention something that Mark described that um, I think is an important lesson learned that um, isn't intuitive to people who don't work in disasters, is that you know, if you compare normal operations of interfacility transfer, you have a fixed facility with staff that stays there, you take your patient, you put them into a resource that's mobile, you move them to another fixed facility with staff. But because you're closing the hospital, that staff becomes mobile. They become a resource that can be part of the response, not just part of the, the disaster. And so being able to use the nurses, the techs, um, because the hospital's gonna close, we don't need them in the building anymore, we actually want them out too, to use them as part of the, of the transport, it, it helps a lot because, like Mark said, you can't just load three NICU babies into an ambulance. That doesn't work well. I mean, you can. Turns out um, you can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, if, but if you load three NICU babies with three NICU nurses into the back of an ambulance, it's really kind of an extension of the NICU um, until they get to where they're going. And then when they get where they're going, they can fold into the resources of the facility that all these facilities were already overwhelmed because we were in the middle yes. of COVID in the wintertime. Um, and, and they were resource poor and resource strapped because of just how many patients and, and staff limitations that having those 
the, those people who were initially kind of, you'd think of them from a disaster standpoint as being affected by the disaster, you're integrating them into the response itself and then integrating them into the supporting facilities that are outside of the disaster area. And so I think that's something that, you know, if you, if you think about this from a, you know, routine operation standpoint, isn't very intuitive. And we had, you know, we'll talk about when we get to Good Sam, you know, to basically talk to the IC, you know, when we're moving ICU patients out, hey, can I use the nurse? And they're like, well, I don't know. I'm like, you know, you don't need her anymore. We're closing the ICU. And it's like, oh yeah, absolutely. You can take the nurse mm -hmm. because they're thinking of a continuing operation standpoint rather than we're closing this place. We're all getting the hell out of here. One of the when you think of this position, right, so there's an EMS person that's going to, to play a role at the hospital to help facilitate the evacuation. That makes that makes very good sense. The hospital's going to do ordering. They're going to do internal triage. Um, and in some coordination with that EMS person, figuring out who's going to go on what ambulance. That all makes very good sense, and it's very clear that that position can play a major role, and it was definitely a lesson learned that we need to standardize that. One of the things that you don't think about, though, is that there is a disaster that's coming, right? So there's, there's this big fire burning there's lots of smoke coming and at some point at Avista one of the nursing staff reported that there were flames outside of one of the windows coming towards the ICU and I'm trying to I'm trying to function as this this evacuation person in an, in an EMS mindset and suddenly I hear this thing that there's a there's there's impinging fire on the building and it's like okay, transition, transition mindset, right? So now I, I have to continue this evacuation, but who is the fire resource here to help function to protect the hospital? Oh, that's also me. <laughs> um, so it, that was the point where, you know, the, the idea of breaking a single window really hit me of this building can catch on fire, this building can burn down, we can lose lives if we don't do something about it. So there was that one single engine coming to the fire to assist with transport, and I just converted them into a, into a fire resource and said, I, I need you to go to this side of the building and I need a situation report essentially. So um, got a situation report that yes, the fire is coming, it is impinging on the building, and there's also a um, psychiatric facility on the property that is going to be impinged upon too. So I'm hearing all of that and thinking, okay, Evacuation must continue. Um, I think it's kind of moving. Medic units are showing up. People seem to be getting in these medic units. I'm gonna focus on the fire. So through that same secondary dispatch center through Broomfield County, I ordered just a traditional, traditional set of resources for a structure fire. And had I tried to do that through incident command, um, it's, it's not that they wouldn't have wanted to try to help or try to delegate those resources. Um, I don't believe they would, have, they would have gotten there in time or maybe ever, depending on where we were at in, this, in the state oh, of the fire. Okay. Yeah, so the, yeah, they certainly would have shown up, but it would have been much, much later. So requesting from a secondary resource, from a secondary dispatch center, um, five engines or four engines in one truck, one truck company, battalion chiefs were dispatched to help with command structure, and we got a safety officer. So that, that response was um, essentially in the same, the same time frame that we would want a response, you know, four to 10 minutes, somewhere in there, all these resources are stacking up. Um, and they were, they were then assigned to different parts of the facility to protect the facility and to start fire suppression activities. Um, my position had to remain in control of that, in command of that, um, until some of the battalion chiefs started to arrive to take over what we were calling divisions of the building itself. Um, and in that, you know, at that point it was, it, it felt okay. It felt like we were kind of gaining some, some structure to what was going on. I returned a little bit to the evacuation process and somewhere in there, I got a report that there was a single house fire in the, the neighborhood adjacent to us. And I think I was communicating, or at least trying to communicate back through PJ. And I think we, we learned this through the whole process. Um, I talked about it before, but radio clicks, right? So you're, you're trying to key up the radio and you're hearing a tone that it's not connecting to a repeater tower, that it's busy, essentially. You're getting a busy signal. And it was, it was a very frustrating component of that. So I'm, I'm trying to talk through the radio. Um, I'm trying to talk on two or three different radio channels from even radios that are walking by me on people. I'm grabbing those to try to talk. Um, and then also on the phone with uh, Michelle Deland, literally with my phone on the table on speakerphone, trying to talk about resources. So it's this, you know, you're, you're talk about task saturated um, and the inability to really uh, to, to grasp everything that's going on. And it was so clear throughout the whole process that I need more people to help me with this command. This is not, you know, this is not functioning well. And one of the big lessons learned from my position was, 
well, I, you know, I'm an EMS chief doing this. It clearly made sense that I'm here. We're also surrounded by communities that have other EMS chiefs that certainly could have supported me. And the idea of reaching out to another one to have them respond never crossed my mind. It was just never something where I thought about calling the Westminster EMS chief or the Thornton EMS chief. And I believe had I been able to look at my phone for longer than five seconds, they were texting me or they were trying to call me. But, um, you know, uh, uh, saturated is, you know, probably a, a mm -hmm. substantial understatement. Yeah, yeah, I was doing I had the same thing. I had I had something like four radios and a cell phone going in my in my car, and, yeah. you know, and I was trying to answer phone calls and text and I, you know, by the end of it I think I had something like 45 unanswered texts. I mean, it was just it was so busy. You talk about that task saturation. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just non-stop just information coming at you, you know, and trying to just trying to react to that um, and it, you know, and prioritize. Mm -hmm. The uh, and so we the other part of this neighborhood, right? So now we've got one single house on fire. Um, and it, it, another lesson learned even from the fire side of it is that uh, in our area, we do not see a lot of wildland urban interface fires. We do not see these things blow through neighborhoods, at least in the, in the, the suburban area that we were in. You definitely see it in the areas where the foothills um, the foothills meet some of our residential homes, but in, in you know, a Broomfield proper, Louisville proper, this is you know, somewhat remarkable for us. So we're not thinking in that mindset and we have firefighters that are structurally minded. They think about structure firefighting. So you've got a house on fire in a neighborhood and our folks are going to go put that fire out in that house. Um, and I'm hearing these things on the radio. I'm hearing this radio tra traffic of going interior to battle this house fire while I'm also dealing with a hospital evacuation. And hearing those things, I, I vividly remember this, of uh, a crew talking about going interior and I'm thinking about hospital evacuation and I go, that doesn't make sense. You should probably redirect that. And I didn't. It, it, was a, it was too much going on for me to actually get on the radio and say something. And there was also a part of me that wanted to have, you know, sort of just trust in the fact that the crew was doing the right thing. In retrospect, going with my gut in that situation would have made more sense. Um, to me, in, in my experience coming from California, that neighborhood was going to be a loss, almost certainly going to be a loss once one house started to go and then we had a second house going and now we've got a crew trying to go inside to battle that house fire. The, the rest of the neighborhood was unfortunately gone within a couple of hours. I mean, 150 homes in that one section of Coal Creek uh, was gone. So at, as a command, it, it was just another reference point in my mind of, um, you know, to be able to do it all over again, hearing those things. And even though you're, you're trying to have faith in what, what the crew is saying, if your gut in that command position is saying they're putting themselves at risk, you need to at least address it. And had I got on the radio and said, you know, um, just repeat your tactics or give me a situation report um, so that I could have understood it better, I may have been able to, um, you know, provide a, a better direction than I did, um, even when I was task saturated. It's still the responsibility of command to ensure protection of, uh, of those folks. It's, it's a lot of cognitive overload too. Yes. Your mind can only process and function so much. Mm -hmm. You heard it, you knew you should probably act on it, but you had so many other things going on, you, you can only task so many things to, to, to do. Right. So, um, I mean, yeah. I probably would have done, any of us probably would have done the, the same thing. You know, I have responsible people there on scene. I'm hoping that they're doing the right thing, like I'm trying to do the right thing here too. Mm -hmm. And the, the fire at that point was, it was to a point where medic units and ambulances coming in to transport patients out were having to drive through fire um, in some sense, right? So fire's not burning the asphalt of the road, but it's certainly burning anything that's on one side to another. It's throwing embers across. And when we have that much wind, flame lengths are laying down. Um, vehicles were literally driving through that. So the other side of, of thinking about egress protection, um, one of the difficulties about a Vista in particular is that it had its one way in and one way out. Um, and trying to think about protecting that egress was definitely something on my mind um, because it, you know, it was the end all be all of, of our folks um, being able to leave and get in, but also those that are still in cars trying to leave you know, on their own accord. Um, there was very little ability for us to give good direction, right? Like in, in the perfect world, I wanna be able to say, you're gonna go out and make a right to be able to get through this. Well, I, I didn't have the situational awareness to tell any of the ambulances or medic units what the best approach was. And that's almost always a part of MCI. They're, they're going to wanna to know how to get to your facility and command wants to know what the best way is. There was, there was very little opportunity for me to have a situation report that would have provided that information. Um, 
Yeah, sorry. Uh, I was just going to say, and to, you know, to make it even more interesting, I mean, you know, typically when you order through an incident command structure, right, a, a resource order goes out, it's filled, they report to a staging area, um, and then they're sent from the staging area to whatever it is they're supposed to mitigate. Well, in this case, you know, since we weren't ordering through normal channels, um, we knew that we had a lot of ambulances coming, but we didn't know necessarily who they were or where they were coming from. Um, and they had been told to respond directly to a VISTA. So as the fire was crossing and the evacuation was in progress, we had lots of other ambulances that were coming in, um, but they were, they were having to you know, drive through fire to, to get to a VISTA because it's you know, one way in, one way out. And then once you get out of the driveway, there's only really two ways to go kind of, you know. And, and so we were, one of the major firefighting priorities then became you know, protecting the access and egress. Um, and, and as that neighborhood to the north, you know, sort of sort of kicked off and more and more homes became involved, um, it started to impact Dillon, which is probably the biggest route in and out of the hospital. And so, you know, that, that priority, you know, the firefighting priority became even more apparent as, you know, we were getting more and more ambulances in and they were having a hard time getting in and we wanted to make sure that they were safe and we could account for them and all that stuff. So, you know, that, that became kind of a huge, huge piece of the evacuation um, that I just didn't want to... We don't want to miss that opportunity. It's, you know, kind of quick question here. It's, it, it sounds like a conflict between kind of the ICS dogma, incident command system dogma of never freelance, stay within the system versus improvise mm -hmm. to solve the problem. Um, you know, it, yeah, one of the things we noted yesterday, and we talked about, you know, yesterday's uh, that's part of the video series as well, was the firefighting aspect of it, and and we made mention of that when you know we call it decentralized command, right? Mm -hmm. And the idea of decentralized command is that you you sort of push, you provide the big broad um, incident command, you know, idea, and then you push the decision making down to the to the folks that are you know actually out into the field. So it's more about you know providing the big the big thing of you know don't get out in front of the fire, don't get yourself into a bad you know situation that you can't get out of you know it's okay to it's okay to you know take your hose off and leave if you have to you know be safe but outside of that you know we trust you to go into a neighborhood and pick your spot and make a stand and, and do you know do the work and so um, it's not how the fire service normally operates but um, in this in this instance it is kind of how we operated until you know farther on in the incident when we had more of the infrastructure uh, that was ordered show up and we could provide those those you know those more um, typical incident command positions and stuff but yeah in the beginning it was it was so fast and things were happening so you know it was just very chaotic and we just didn't have the resources that we needed and so we really did have to kind of um, you know trust our folks to to do a good job and and provide them with sort of that bigger picture um, incident command you know advice and then let them go to work Mm -hmm. Interagency uh, cooperation prior to these incidents is what, what made this more smooth as well. If, if we didn't have that relationship, if I don't have the, the confidence in my folks' ability and my crew's abilities to, to manage these situations and to make good decisions with, with their experience in mind and what they're seeing in front of them, it makes all of this much more difficult and probably less likely to be as successful as it was. Um, it felt very comfortable for me to function outside of the normal ICS structure because it was the only choice in my opinion. It was, it was looking at this and thinking, I can either not do the thing that needs to happen or I'm gonna do it and I just have to do it this other way. And I think that that's, you know, when you're talking about a mature system and a mature growth of, of relationships and development in the, in the community of your, of your fire-based resources, of your EMS-based resources, of law enforcement, all of those things develop into to really to have competent people that work amongst you and with you and um, that's what made this such a success was the relationships that we could depend on um, from you know senior leadership from from hospital to ems fire based stuff all the way down to the private ambulances that were responding and the emts that are on that having to make a decision that they've never made in their life before and um, you know and we we have a, a, a saying in the fire service of risk a lot to save a lot and this was certainly that day and it made a lot of sense to to be there and doing what we were doing um, in the way that we were doing it because they're really wasn't much of another option, honestly. No, there wasn't. No. Um, and the the other thing that I, I didn't talk about was the. So we have we have NICU patients that are going into an ambulance that's not really set up for them. Um, the next set of patients that went were ICU patients. Um, ICU patients at most times, or in some times, they're they're on ventilators. Um, and to transport a patient that's on a ventilator that has an endotracheal tube or they're, they're being ventilated by an artificial machine, um, typically we like to have that person on a transport ventilator when we're moving them to a different facility. 
those transport ventilators generally come from critical care transport units or CCT ambulances. That day, those CCT ambulances were unlikely to show up in the time frame that we need them. In fact, I didn't see a single CCT ambulance show up out of Vista. Fortunately, in our area, two of our fire-based EMS services, North Metro Fire and Thornton Fire, carry transport ventilators. Um, we don't typically use them in this particular circumstance to move a patient from a hospital to a different hospital. We use them for scene calls. But because those two agencies responded to Avista to help with the evacuation, we were able to move our ICU patients much more um, efficaciously, much better for them um, than taking them off of that ventilator and trying to bag them with a BVM to their destination hospital, which could be 20 minutes away or it could be 45 minutes away, depending on where you're going to have to go. So um, we were very quickly able to get just 911 paramedic ambulances to show up and move ICU patients on a ventilator, which is much better for care, as opposed to having to wait for CCT or doing something that's just not, not in the best situation for that patient. Um, not that we couldn't have done it, but when you've got somebody that's coming from the ICU on other drips um, and we're already having to manage a different type of patient, having that ventilator played a, a major role in time, um, time to destination for that person. So I, that was definitely another big win. Yeah, I, I think that, Mark, is, is, is it was key to a lot of our situation, not just at Avista, but moving on to the next evacuation there at Good Sam is being able to use the resources that you have at hand. They may not be the most ideal um, mm -hmm. resources, um, but as long as you use them in the proper manner, um, you know, efficaciously in, you know, in what you're doing, it, it made sense, and we wouldn't be able to do any of the evacuations with, without it. Yeah. Mark, quick question. How many of the ambulances that we got at Good Sam were actually spun up and requested for a Vista and just pivoted over to it? Was that a significant chunk and why we had so many so early? Well, yeah, once, once, the, once the evacuation of a, Vista, of a Vista had been completed, so we moved the 31 patients to other facilities, um, we still had a couple of ambulances showing up to a Vista looking for patients. Those ambulances um, were redirected back into the incident. How that actually functioned, I don't know. We didn't have a great path. In, this, in the same idea of a major incident, you always you try to put those resources to a directed radio channel, right? They're gonna go to operations A channel or whatever it is for that incident. Well, not every responding private agency in our area, private ambulance company, had the right channel, and we were on a different channel than the incident itself anyway. So um, trying to get those, those ambulances tied in really came back down to the healthcare coalition and, and assuring that resource order that was coming out was directing them to the right place. And I don't know, PJ, if you can speak to where those, those ambulances oh, went. I, I, I know. Um, so before you called me, um, I got a phone call from two private amb ambulance services, and they both were staged at the, um, the mall. Flatirons, at the right. flat at the Flatirons Mall, yeah. um, because they came up to a Vista, they weren't needed. They knew that they shouldn't go back because they knew that they're going to need it at some point in time. So they stayed up in the area. So Flatirons Mall uh, is where the incident command uh, team eventually set up. So they were in staging. Oh, were they? Yep. Okay. okay. So that, that's where the staging was for the. Incident. Oh, nice. So they just went back into staging. That was that was a part of it though was that you know you feel you've you've got these resources that you think are coming and then there's other resource resources showing up that you didn't know are coming and getting them all back into the incident that that was actually a little bit of a you know, sort of an unknown thing from somebody who was in command of the hospital evacuation of me like, oh, okay, where did this ambulance come from and now where are they going? Keeping track of that was was genuinely almost unrealistic uh, at a Vista. It wasn't like we were sitting there with a clipboard saying, um, AMR Medic 1 is going to this hospital. Um, that was being taken care of by the charge nurse inside the hospital doors and they were walking right past me and other than what may have been tracked inside the hospital, um, we were certainly not able to do it in the a very effective, detailed manner as we were at Good Sam later that night. Yeah, it was it was truly an emergent situation. Yes, I mean, yes. It was it was as fast as you could go. Right, just get them out. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that was the difference between when we stood up our incident command team, understanding what had just occurred at Avista. Decision had been made that we were going to start to evacuate our patients. At the time that we got that call, we had 184 inpatients, not including the ED. Um, uh, volume that was um, in place and so you know it was very daunting to consider mm -hmm. how we were you know realistically going to be able to make that happen 
And if everyone remembers the environment that we were in in Q4 2021, there mm -hmm. were no beds. Mm -hmm. yes. There were no beds in the entire metro area. I mean, the COVID response, um, and it wasn't entirely a COVID response um, that was that it was a directly related to, but we'd all been in calls about the divert status and not being able to bed people. We couldn't get people out of the hospital. So it was truly a crisis in terms of where we were gonna find places for these patients to land. And we had just moved 30 patients from one hospital to, to, the, right. to, to these other these hospitals. Others. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so a couple good, couple good things that, uh, to bring up here is one is, you know, if you're thinking about this for evacuation, you know, move the patients farther away because one of the hospitals that we considered moving patients to was Good Sam. Yes. Right. And we were, so, you know, effectively we would have moved them from Avista to Good mm -hmm. Sam and then had yeah. to move them mm -hmm. again. And, you know, uh, just a stroke of luck where they wanted to keep them in the same hospital system. We didn't move them to Good Sam. So, right. you know, uh, if you're thinking about hospital evacuations like think about that next hospital down the line and are they being impacted and you know how far should you move those patients and then um, you know kind of secondly is the is the point you brought up is like you know there, it was truly a, a you know we were in the midst of a pretty big COVID surge and, and there was you know short staff it was the holidays there was no I mean there was no mm -hmm. beds available anywhere and there hadn't been for you know, a couple months. Months. Like it was minimum of weeks. Yeah, it six, wasn't eight a, weeks. Wasn't it a great been. time. They so. were literally we would were moving patients within the state just to make room yeah. for, for all those that um, in on this panel that remember that. And so, you know, I think really as operations section chief and just to speak to that was, you know, working with with Rob um, from Incident Command um, in terms of transportation EMS liaison. Um, and getting down to the emergency department. And I, I want to speak a little bit to your point of sort of a objectives-based incident within an incident yeah. command structure. Yeah. Um, it, that occurred at Good Sam as well. Again, um, you might remember I, I said we didn't have a lot of our, a lot of our leaders were new. Um, a lot of our senior leadership wasn't present um, for the event itself. And so really setting up um, the strategy for how we were going to evacuate uh, the hospital, which meant really closing the ED and, and moving patients from the ED, stopping all of our procedural um, and operative uh, operations that were taking place and sending those patients out, and then really deciding that we needed to move our critical patients. We had laboring moms, um, and we had NICU patients, and we had at that point an over, you know, we were at capacity in our ICU as well. And so those were our priority patients to get moved out. So we knew that, and so from an incident command perspective, and I've shared this um, since the event because it was such a great tool for us to use in incident command. Um, and when I say incident command, I mean sort of in the, you know, in the center of the hospital, really trying to make those decisions, was we had literally a shared Google sheet that we were using with our, um, first call center um, that we'd been very in close contact with for weeks again just moving patients trying to find bad capacity issues um, and working within our own system to just start laying out the patients that needed to go pr and prioritizing those patients and then once i was able to get information that we had a location to send then communicating to rob in the emergency department had its own sort of structure and process going on very independently, which was great because our communication was via cell phones. And again, we didn't have radios and these were opportunities that you know we've discussed at length. Um, but really my communication was to Rob to say when we had, we had a location for a patient. So we had physicians, Dr. Foster, Dr. Rosa, Mark was there you know, in order to be able to go and pull patients when we had critical care resources. Yeah, I wanted to give props to you guys real quick because, you know, I mean, recognizing, at, you know, seeing what happened at Avista and then, you know, recognizing how, mu how much of a much bigger problem uh, Good Samaritan was going to be because it's so much larger and there's so many more patients. Um, you know, you guys did an amazing job, like standing up your hospital instant command and then recognizing that you were also being impacted by smoke and we're likely going to have the same, you know, the same issues, um, but it was just going to take a lot longer and a lot more resources. And, you know, because again, you know, f getting focused, task focused on, you know, the fire, it wasn't in my mind that you guys, you know, 10 miles away, we're going to, we're going to be under the same event. And, you know, so yeah. getting mm -hmm. that call was like, mm -hmm. sort of like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, but luckily, you know, I had Mark on speed dial at that yeah. point. So. so I had I had just left this Avista evacuation and uh, you had gotten another phone call from PJ um, that a good Sam is potentially evacuating as well. Can you go over there and look into that? And it was like, oh, I've just done this. This is great. I, I have plenty of experience. Nice, right? Yeah. Yes. And so I, um, as, as I pulled up to get some air in, it was kind of surreal. Same idea. The wind is still absolutely significant. It's hard to like hear anything outside. And I walked in the doors. And I'm, and I'm thinking of all these same things, right? I'm thinking of how do we, how do we triage a hospital that essentially has triple the, the number of patients in census, triple the number of patients in this hospital. How do we do all these things that I just did, maybe with a little bit more time on our hands? And I walked in and Rob was there um, and, and definitely had a better grasp on a lot more of what we needed and what was already taking place. You know, before we get too far into it, I, I wanna point out a contrast between the Avista operation and the Good Sam operation of this level of threat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and in the context of, you know, again, normal, yeah. normal hospital operational mindset that could actually cause harm because it's absolute dogma that, you know, if I'm transferring a patient from one hospital to another, they do not leave until that other hospital has accepted them and they know where they're going to go. And I hold mm -hmm. them until that point. Whereas, and I don't know if you got to this point, but you just considered it when we talked afterwards of, if you have a resource shows up, I don't know where you're going, I need you to get outside of the fire mm -hmm. and then figure out someplace safe to go mm -hmm. after that. There was, so yeah, there was some of that. And it, so at Avista, the, the, uh, the system idea of, of remaining with, uh, keeping a patient within the system, that became sort of a point of, of uh, friction as well, where I'm, I'm hearing the internal dialogue of the hospital, and obviously this is, this is something that's actually patient important, right? If you can keep the patient within the system, there's probably better continuity of care there. Yes. At the time though, from an EMS standpoint and from somebody who's hearing and seeing the firefight that's occurring outside, the, the, the you know, attempting to do fire suppression outside and trying to get people off property, hearing that inside, um, at one point I said, we need to consider hospitals outside the system and we need to leave now. You know, making those statements of like, uh, just just re re uh, re pointing to the fact of the significance of the event and that the the rules the dogma does not apply today yeah. um, that that was an important thing that I do think at least helped to speed up that process and I said the same things there that day I said if we if we don't know where they're going just get them off property just get them off property and I believe they still even with all that was going on the hospital was still remarkable enough to find destinations for a vista but a good Sam that that became substantially different um, later that night yeah. trying to find beds yeah but we also were under much lower acuity threat and had time and yeah. could be thoughtful Right. which yes. is a very different scenario. Mm -hmm. Yeah, having the benefit of time and planning to our advantage really helped. Planning, right? Yes. Planning. Yeah. Well, and planning. planning. And, and, and somebody I, that's already done it before who's yeah. an expert. Right. Right. <laughs> well, and I think to Jason's point too, it's like being thoughtful because moving patients, if there's not a clear and present risk, is dangerous. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so to make that decision, it's a hard decision to make. We had, you know, we had laboring mothers that were getting into an ambulance, not with their spouses. Mm -hmm. Their spouses were redirected. They had to go um, by private vehicle with terrible traffic, smoke, mm -hmm. you know, all of those things. And we did have moms that rolled into the receiving hospital and imminently delivered. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and so, you know, to, to transfer a patient in a situation, yes, it can be absolutely essential and it's important to make the decisions about who needs the most resources, the more difficult resources to get. Um, and But to know that you do have to be thoughtful and assess risk and mm -hmm. really know what's going out and, and going on in the community and containment and those sorts of things so that you don't have to unnecessarily put a patient at risk. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's 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 what was going on sort of behind the incident command doors um, when having to make those decisions because obviously Avista was going to was imminently potentially going to burn there were flames outside where we didn't necessarily see mm -hmm. see that but we had to be prepared um, just due to how quickly it all came through yeah. yeah and also to the fact that it wasn't so much the fire risk but like it happened to Vista at first was the, the smoke oh, no. mm -hmm. the smoke coming to your hospital your air handlers can only handle yep. so much mm -hmm. um, and you know we don't want our patients you know our staff you know in, in that or, or the community when we made the decision to start the evacuation at uh, Good Samaritan Hospital, um, Abby in the incident command directed me down to the ER to help 
basically to be the transportation officer um, to where my job was going to be, hey, Rob, you have this patient and you need to facilitate the transport from uh, our hospital to the other facility. Um, and um, not all patients are created equal, you know, in, in the hospital. So first we did evacuate mother, baby, and, and the, the NICU. But because we were a little delayed from Avista, we started to get resources. So we were able to get neonatal transport teams there. Um, and then we started to get some ambulances to get those mother, baby patients out. Then it came time for us to evacuate the um, ICUs. Um, and just prior to this, uh, Dr. Rusa and Dr. Foster called me and um, said, hey, we're on our way. Let us know what, what you need us to do to help. So uh, once they arrived and realizing that I have a bunch of ICU patients and a very limited amount of critical care transports, and I know in my ICU I have some very sick patients that need critical care, and I have some other patients who may just need a ventilator to go from point A to point B. But I couldn't be up there to determine which crews I needed to send up there for that. Or, or so, some that were just getting like blood right. sugars every hour and were otherwise stable, but right. that's just the only place that can happen yeah, in the right. hospital because of the frequency of checks. Yeah, so, uh, so a triage system almost needed to be set up in the, in the ICU. Mm -hmm. So um, Jason was able to go up there and, and, and do that for us. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I, I think you know another kind of lesson learned is to be very open-minded um, and 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 what you're going to do because as I was being called in, I was like, well, what am I useful for in this situation? I'm an emergency medicine physician. I'm EMS physician. Well, I could probably convert any ambulance into a critical care ambulance. So that was probably what I was going to do. And my mind was, hey, there's going to be critical care patients without critical care transport ambulances. Can I run a vent and drips and and be able to get that patient out? Um, it turned out that the much more useful role was actually even kind of outside of the incident command system of just being a bit of a facilitator and a communicator mm -hmm. because we had a situation where we had lots of ambulances ready to go of different kinds. We had an ICU that doesn't understand EMS and pre-hospital operations and for Dr. Foster and I to be able to go up and, and we basically said, well, why don't we just go up and see what's in the ICU? Mm -hmm. And we got up there, and I can't remember the physician's name who was the ICU attending was up there rounding on patients. And we basically said, let's round on the whole unit mm -hmm. and go over what we have and what they need to move. And we found out that really there were very few patients that were critically ill, ventilated, multiple drips. There were a couple of those, mm -hmm. but a lot of them were even lower acuity. Some of them even went, ended up going by BLS or two patients in one BLS ambulance um, because they were just very stable. They just needed a ride to go to another ICU where they could continue their care. Mm -hmm. um, and we would have never known that, and it's very hard to get that other than just say, well, uh, we'll just go up there and look, and then come back down. And then the same issue of, well, I think at one point even, um, I think the incident command wasn't aware that we had the resources and the patients ready to go. Um, and we're like, well, why isn't anything moving yet? And, and, and so the ICU didn't know that the resources were there. And so we just started, hey, start sending up ambulances mm -hmm. and we'll yep. match people up as they get here. And again, being flexible, being open-minded, and then also, you know, allowing, you know, for me, I, I, again, I, I, one of the things that stands out to me is I never told anybody what to do that whole day. No. I just mm -hmm. asked people, yep. what can you do? What mm -hmm. do you need? Um, are you okay with mm -hmm. taking this patient that's a little bit more complicated? And they said, well, if there's someone who can run the vent, sure, why not? You know, go to the RT, the respiratory therapist. Hey, are you okay with going with this patient? going to the ICU nurse, are you okay with going with this patient? You know, we'll get you back or we'll get you where you need to go afterwards, but kind of asking people what they had to offer, what they were willing to do, what they were comfortable with, and kind of just matching up, you know, matching up resources to need. Um, and again, it wasn't, I didn't really feel like I was part of the instant command structure, which is a very uncomfortable place for me to be, having, you know, been an ICS zealot for, you know, 20 some years now. <laughs> um, but just kind of being, well, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? What can I do to help? And, and I think that that mindset, um, because again, I was doing something that I had never even thought about doing before. Um, and certainly wasn't what I expected that I'd be having to do on arrival. And I think Dr. Foster felt the same way. I think we thought we would be running ambulance, ambulance transfers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, in Go, go ahead, Peter. Uh, I was just going to say, I, I think that's a huge lesson learned from this is, you know, as, from an EMS perspective, you know, you need to get your medical director 
on site because the medical directors are physicians that work in hospitals. They speak the hospital lingo. They know how to talk physician to physician, um, but they also understand the EMS system and, and EMS operations. And I mean, that was a huge win for us to have you there to be able to, you know, not necessarily downgrade, but just, you know, interact with the hospital operations and say, yeah, we can, we can do this. We can use this level of ambulance for this type of patient. And you know, it just it just made everything go so much faster and smoother. Yeah, it, it never even occurred to the ICU staff that you could put two patients in an ambulance because they never do that, mm -mm. right? ICU patients never go, right. you know. And it's like, well, we might be able to three. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, and I would like to hit on something that you you said, Jason. Um, you kept saying, "What do you need me to do? What, what how can I help?" And that was the, almost the mantra of, of that day at Good Sam. Um, Mark uh, was probably the first outside resource that, that came to Good Sam. And the first thing he said is, Rob, what, what do you need me to do? And said, Mark, I need ambulances. I don't care what you get me, I need ambulances. Um, and then so he did that. He ran on his own, he got, he got me ambulances. And once they arrived, we had um, uh, air transport show up with just their bags. They knew they weren't flying. So they grabbed their stuff out of the helicopter and drove it in their personal cars down to Good Sam. And then we had cross companies who were just like, hey, um, th this company, I don't work for them, but we have a critical patient. I'll put my, I'll go with them with my equipment. There was, there was no, I need to stay with my partner. There was no, stay, I need to stay with my agency. It was, what do we need to do right now to get, the, to get these patients out? And it, it, was, it was heartwarming to, 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 to see that mm -hmm. that day. It was always, what do you need us to do? Um, I had um, e EMS um, officers from other hospitals in there. Rob, you know, what can I do to help? Taking, taking down reports, taking down names, everything. Everybody worked as one cohesive group that day. It was, it was quite awesome. I think looking back, you know, sort of retrospectoscope and, and looking at that, I, I feel like, you know, in, in incident command where we were and doing the best that we could to communicate um, and you talk about task saturation, you know, where you're trying to, to load spreadsheets, there wasn't a whole lot of extra help and taking phone calls from your own teams, your own staff that have left and, you know, are struggling and yeah. stuck in traffic and, you know, communication becomes um, challenging, uh, I would say. But it did feel like at a certain point in time, the decision had been made to move the moms, the babies, the ICU patients, but we had this, um, we had a really incredible EMS response, but there was sort of a, um, a log jam with getting the ICU patients out, which then limited our ability to match some of the um, available rigs to patients, you know, that maybe we could have uh, evacuated sooner. And I think it was, I, that's what it felt like to me is that at a certain point in time, you're like, okay, where patients were ready, you know, right. getting those pulled out yep. so that we could then use all of the other resources and, and move more quickly yeah. the patients that could move more quickly. Yeah, I think once we realized that the IC was ready is when we're able to cross people from different agencies mm -hmm. um, onto those ambulances. Um, instead of waiting for a critical care truck, we have critical yeah. care equipment. You take your stuff, you're going to go in with, with, with this crew um, for this and you know and then once that came to fruition and then once you know Jason and Colleen were able to say hey we got a vent patient but it probably doesn't have to go by critical care as long as the ambulance might have a vent on it so that's when we were to utilize North Metro and, and, and Thornton um, there for, for those was, was, a, was a huge help. Right which is another thing where if you have a hospital based physician even an emergency physician they're not going to be familiar with the capabilities of the pre-hospital mm -hmm. resources of hey these two agencies happen to have transport vents, which is kind of unusual in Colorado, um, mm -hmm. and so we can we can be able to use those, and they would just it would be invisible to someone who didn't understand those operations. No. Right. We did have uh, it was a pretty remarkable image of um, a little bit into the evening, so maybe six o'clock. We're we're still in the process of evacuating Good Samaritan, and there are forty or fifty ambulances, medic yeah. units in in the parking lot in staging, and it was a remarkable image of it. Mm -hmm. But what it was was an indicator of that kind of log jam in yes. some sense of either patients not being able to leave because we're prioritizing certain subsets of patients or that we didn't have destination sets up, set up as well. So we spoke about that before where 
Yeah, yeah there's was. there's beds are hard to come by, and we have to try to set up these transports. And it was it was a remarkable image of seeing all these ambulances. Um, yeah, that's etched in my brain yeah. forever. Yeah, and right. And and that's a clear inverse of the previous hospital yes. where it was we needed to wait until we had a good place to send these folks because that is a that's a dangerous transition in their care, and we have time to wait and we're safe to wait. And you know, again, being able to be open-minded and pivot from one mindset at one facility to this is a, the situation's changed now, and we can do this. So again, I, I think, I th I think that you can get into a lot of trouble by having a lot of presuppositions, by having your ego in place there of this is how this is going to happen because this is how it happens. Um, I didn't see a lot of that, and I think that that could have been very problematic um, had that happened, and we didn't see a lot of that. And so I think that's really something to call out and reinforce of. We need, to, we need to pivot, be flexible, we need to slow down or speed up as needed. Um, and then also, also noticing opportunities of, hey, I got patients, I got rigs, they're not moving together, oh, nobody knows they're ready to go, cool, let's, let's make that happen then. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that blend, I think, really, really worked well uh, I, that day. And I had, um, I've, I've spoken to that shared uh, document that I had been using to communicate with uh, First Call, who had been arranging, and once they had a, uh, a location that was sort of locked in and set, then it would populate, I'd be able to see it, and then I would communicate with Rob. Mm -hmm. Where I think there would have been an opportunity, and I've seen pictures too from the, from the event from the ED, mm -hmm. um, where we had identified someone with the role to sit with their own mm -hmm. spreadsheet and identify which patients had gone and with what um, company and when they left, right. and you know, it could have been the same. Mm -hmm. Do you, yeah. you know what I mean? And I feel like that is a huge opportunity if we had had someone in sort of that, um, the brain of the ED right there that was looking at the same thing I was looking mm -hmm. at, um, that was the same thing that First Call was working from, then, and it would allow me that, that reverse information to tell Incident Command like, no, I know for sure that they've left, they've rolled, mm -hmm. these patients have rolled, and some of that was hard to get back mm -hmm. to go back because your PI your safety officer came in and yeah it was one of our administrative yeah. captains uh, just came in from home literally to do to that, do and that. Yeah. used his Excel spreadsheet knowledge fabulously to <laughs> yeah. do that yes, it that was, was, was a remarkable spreadsheet yes, right yeah, yeah. but Gorgeous. we did have um, interestingly we had four patients that left Good Samaritan and went to one particular hospital and because of the resource the drain of resources the lack of resources there they were already overwhelmed we actually had to re-divert that ambulance to a different to a different hospital. Right. So they're calling saying, we've arrived at the emergency department and they're saying they can't take this patient type, this particular patient, what do we do, where do we go? And being able to actually put them on, put that crew on the phone with our medical director to get an idea of what that patient's looking like, do they need to just make a, you know, a ploy to be able to stay there or a plea to stay there, um, that was another big win for having the ability just to hand the phone off to a doctor. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and that language, again, do you feel comfortable taking this patient to the next place, or does that not feel good to you? Do you have enough fuel? Mm -hmm. um, you know, do you have enough oxygen? Are you, can you guys make that run? Because if you don't feel comfortable, I'll make it not happen. Mm -hmm. And they're like, no, I think we can do it, doc. And it's like, cool, let's do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and then also being able to say, all right, cool, if they say they can't go, I can talk to the people who I know at that emergency department to say, hey, these guys can't leave property. You need, that, you need to stabilize that patient before they can load and go because of this and this. Mm -hmm. And, and get that done. I never had to do that, but that was the preparation of being able to, hey, if I need to strong arm this, I can strong arm it, or if we're cool with just you know, pivoting off to another facility and we can do that safely, let's go and do that. And trusting that crew to be able to make that call because they're the ones right there looking at the scene and I'm on a phone you know, 30 miles away. Yeah, and you know, in the resource allocation, um, we had so many ambulances um, we had ambulances from the far eastern plains of Colorado um, who's showing up there and they're an hour and a half to two hours away um, just to be there for, you know, a community response, which was, which was great. Just wanted to be a part of it, honestly. You know, right. I'm, I'm, yeah, I was, to, to I, be there to help. I was on the phone with them saying, uh, yeah, I was on yeah, the phone yeah. saying like, I, I don't know if we'll need you by then. It's almost easier for us to just turn a rig around from a hospital that they've dropped off at and come back before you may even get here. And they're like, no, we'll come. We, we, if there's something we can do, we'll be there. We'll be yeah. there. I was like, yeah. you know, okay, sounds great. Thank you very much. Yeah, which, which was great because in the, 
a case of, let's say we did decide to evacuate the whole hospital. Um, after we got those critical care patients out, the mother babies, we probably had enough ambulances there to evacuate the hospital within probably an hour. Um, and we did discuss, uh, we discussed the idea of using school buses or RTD buses, just regular buses, city buses. Um, and I made that request through the healthcare coalition to Michelle Dillon and said, I, 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 I need buses. I don't exactly know what I'm going to do, but I need buses. And um, within a few minutes, she was able to align two school buses to come to the hospital to help facilitate yeah. that evacuation had it been necessary. Right. We did have buses that did arrive. And, and I think to speak towards like the centralized command, um, when we had uh, requested that everyone report down to incident command for briefing, you know, initially it was just to tell them to take flashlights just in case we lost power, you know, some of your basic things, right? So flashlights in case we lost power, or making sure that everything um, is on the red outlets, you know, in case we had to go to generator power. Um, but really, I can't speak enough to our physician response as well. Um, in knowing that we were planning on evacuating, it was they really went charge nurse and um, and physician down each to each patient room to discontinue any unnecessary drips, you know, so that patients yeah. we could just immediately get things printed, get them ready, communicate with family, and then identify which patients we could wheel down to staging areas where they could load to a bus um, in the event that we need to uh, or that we had needed to. Um, so. It, it was really a, a great effort all around um, and speaking to that the bus piece was was really um, important to understand which of those patients if we really did have to load quickly we could have done um, and so we couldn't have done that without their help as well and I think speaking to drips and equipment and resources too you know we had to send some of our pumps we had um, we were sending to places again that really didn't have any further capacity to manage patients. Mm -hmm. um, and so whether you know we had to send IV pumps, ventilators ended up yep. going um, at, because we were at a, at a point where our system was running low on ventilators at the time just because of the capacity issues we were seeing. So um, that was just another consideration mm -hmm. is to remember that we were sending not just human resources and staff resources, but we were sending equipment resources as well. And so some of that also, the tracking piece of it, um, got challenging as as well that was an opportunity yeah, yeah. well because a key piece of that is right i mean it, it, once the fire is over we you have to bring those patients back, back and you have to be able mm -hmm. to take care of them so yeah and i think it, that's a that's a good spot to to talk about how so we're talking about the the potential for stopping this evacuation or slowing the evacuation down and reconsidering what we're doing and yeah. why we're doing it but then also making sure that we're tying into the incident itself. So in retrospect of looking at this and trying to take lessons learned, we've definitely identified that the, that person that was playing my role that day needs to be able to provide situational awareness of the fire and what the incident is through incident command to be able to inform the hospital staff, the hospital yeah. command center of what's going on, how bad is it, or is it really not that bad? And I don't know, PJ, if you can speak to more of how that, that Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, it, so I, I don't remember what time it was, but it was it was later in the evening. I got, you know, I got a call from Mark and he said, you know, hey, well, how's the fire looking? You know, we're wondering if we need to continue the evacuation or, you know, how it seems like the smoke has dissipated a bit, but, you know, what are you seeing? And um, so I was able to, you know, get a pretty good drive of the fire and get up, you know, get up on a hill and kind of get a look at it. And I said, you know, yeah, it does seem to be, uh, much calmer, like the winds are calmer, you know, we're hearing, you know, weathers, you know, the winds are kind of dying down a little bit. Um, and I said, yeah, I mean, it looks good from here. And it's, you know, it's not making the huge runs that it was making before. Um, and the smoke is, you know, going more up than down, you know, more up than out, right, towards you guys. And so I said, yeah, I think, I think this is a, it's a good point to consider pausing the evacuation. And so he was able to relay that to, to mm -hmm. Abby to, and yeah. command. Yeah. And That's a, it worked out being a great line of communication as opposed to, you know, a hospital command trying to get in contact with incident command through a process that may not be set up. So this provided a direct link back yes. into ICS um, very clearly to somebody who could give a very, you know, a mindset driven about hospital too. It wasn't just um, somebody talking from a fire aspect. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I remember that pause because the pause was, hey, just a quick second, why are we evacuating right now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, do we really think the hospital's gonna burn down right now? No, we don't. Right. Okay, well, you know, and, and this was after we'd gotten the critical patients out, which is important to do quickly, mm -hmm. or to start quickly, because yeah. it takes so long yeah. to do, that once we started having patients where we were thinking of loading them on a bus, it's like, well, 
you know, we could come back in an hour and get a bus and load all these patients up and go. Like that's not going to take had the as resources. long. resources. Yeah. Right. So, so I think very much, you know, also asking those open-ended questions. Well, why are we doing this? Um, well, well, I don't know. Let's go find out why. And then when we asked, we said, actually, no, we're safe now. And so let's hold tight and, and see what the morning brings. And, and mm -hmm. so that, I, re I remember that transition in, in the goal too, where again, you can get that inertia of, well, this is what we're doing. Yes. Yeah. And, and then, you know, yes. find out that you end up kind of going too far down that road exactly. because you haven't taken a look at where you are. Yeah, that's that definitely... situational awareness was so, yeah. you know, because we didn't, we're in a room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you can't literally see the fire, watching you can't... the news where they're showing, yeah. rehashing just, you know, flames right. everywhere. Mm -hmm. But yeah. the, in reality, what's really happening? Yeah. Yeah, and to have the confidence too that you know if the winds do pick up as they do here, that we were, we're ready and able to evacuate the rest of those patients. But mm -hmm. that that uh, that timeout pause um, is something you don't always do it. You know, in an event like this, it's go. You know, until everything is done. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of reevaluations and stuff don't always happen, which which is great. That I mean, PJ's reevaluation, our reevaluation, you know, was was key to not move a lot of patients that potentially didn't need to be moved. Yeah. And then looking at Avista in particular, you know, the, the idea, the same thing happened. The place didn't burn down but it was closed for 21 days yeah. just for cleanup, for environmental yeah. processing of the entire facility itself. So, you know, it, it, we absolutely at times were like, do we really think this place is gonna burn? And it, that part didn't actually matter. You know, it was much mm -hmm. more about smoke impingement mm -hmm. and just the deterioration of the yeah. quality of the inside air of the facility yeah. for, yeah. Yeah. for yeah. the it's, OR. It's, it's inoperable. And, and there's yeah. all those other considerations too. Like, I mean, you know, we used all of the water in Louisville and Superior to the point where they had to dump raw water from a lake into the water system to support firefighting operations. And in then even then, you know, enough structures got lost that, you know, the water pressure just couldn't be maintained anymore. And then we lost, you know, water for firefighting as well. But, you know, we also shut off the gas to the whole town and we kind of discussed that in the firefighting uh, video. But, you know, it's like not very often that you, you ask of your of your utility, can you please turn off the gas to an entire city? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. but we yeah. did. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's all those downstream effects of like, OK, the next day uh, there is a blizzard Good rolling blizzard. in and it is going to be freezing temperatures. And now there's no heat. The pipes mm -hmm. are going to burst and you've got this hospital that not only has been impacted by smoke, ash and soot, but now there's no water. There's no you know, there's no gas, there's no anything, and you know, it, and it does. It, like, it takes 21 days to get get those hospitals yeah. back up and running, and um, so there are, you know, a lot of downstream effects to those decisions you're making, and things to think yeah. about for sure. Yeah. Versus Good Sam, where I was working the 10 a.m. shift the next day, and yeah. we were open again, <laughs> and we were, but then we were also having the scrounge of, well, we don't have OB services right now, mm -hmm. so we're going to have to deliver in the ED if if a, if a laboring mom shows up until that's back online it takes a few hours you know we don't have the icu up and running yet mm -hmm. it's going to take a few hours um, but again we had we had what what time did they open at 7a for the 7 a.m doors opened yeah so yeah. The, the ed was back operational at 7 a.m yep we had yeah. one um uh, we had amr posted outside all yeah. night just, just in case. case yeah so yeah so basically we, even though we weren't going to evacuate anymore we decided you know the incident command decided to leave the er, ER closed um, because if we had somebody that needed uh, emergency services, you know, outside the ER, you know, cath labs, OB, surgery, we had closed them down. Um, we didn't have the staff. Um, so, you know, I like the fact, and plus those doors opening and closing all night with that fire still going, that smoke and that soot is going to be coming in, into the ER. So, um, you know, taking that administrative, you know, leadership to say, hey, we're going to close the E down for, for the night. Um, we'll reopen in the morning, you know, um, sure it was not easy to do, but it was absolutely the right decision to do. Right, and I think that, you know, one thing that you can't take away from this event is that we, this is a community we all work and li we live in, you know, and so there were a lot of physicians and nurses, um, housekeepers that lost their homes, you know, yeah. and so not only are you, yes, you need to staff, you know, your units, you know, at a time where that was challenging anyway, um, and so there's a big contingent of people that that lost a lot, you know, and yeah. we're scrambling to figure figure things out. So from a leadership perspective, I mean, that was something that you couldn't ignore and that had to be addressed. And you had to accept and prepare and plan for the fact that you might have people that won't be able to come back, you know, for a little bit. And how do you accommodate them? 
as yeah. well. How, how did you guys end up dealing with that? And then like, kind of, how did you end up dealing with like, was there any like mental health impact afterwards, you know? Yes, and I, and I think that was, I, I feel like we could have done a, a better job um, of doing that maybe on a larger scale. I think that we brought in foundation resources, you know, early and sent a lot of communications. It was really top of mind for the, for the senior leadership. Um, to discuss and make sure that they had resources that they could contact and that we could set them up with emergency resources, money, funds, um, aside from what was happening within the larger community. But yeah, we did offer um, we did. EAP resources. We did. Um, you know, like Abby was saying, we have a, you know, it's a community, large community hospital. The people that work there live, you know, in Louisville Superior. You know, just like Mark alluded to earlier, his house was in the line of fire. But he went home real quick, but he knew that the community needed him. Um, just like with our, our staff and our nurses, they were watching out the windows, taking care of their patients while they knew their houses were burning down. Mark had his cats in his <laughs> operational vehicle um, that he had to evacuate <laughs> from his house. Yeah. <laughs> they did fine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, but again, that that's sort of the level of, you know, you got to remember that, you know, it's one, you know, I've done disaster response at the federal level where you're showing up in a region and you live very, very far away. And in this situation, I was very blessed to live, you know, outside of the fire zone as well. But many of your responders are not just working it, but they're affected by it in parallel. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, you know, Mark's situation is, is you know, exactly as it amplifies that, that his, you know, his, his the rest, of, the rest of his outside life is at risk with the house and, and and everything, and making sure that that's safe, so that he can engage in the fire. Like that, that's a that's a microcosm of the big picture of how do you make sure that people, you know, feel safe that they're that that they're um, able to engage in their jobs mm -hmm. um, in real time. I think that's an important an important part of of how you operate during these disasters. And thinking from the, the fire aspect of this too, that, and, and I don't know if PJ, if you've already spoken to this, but the, the idea of uh, the job of being a firefighter is to put out the fires, right? And, and if you live and work in that same community and every day that you drive to work or you drive through your community, you see one half of your neighborhood is gone um, because we couldn't stop this fire. There's certainly something of, of, you know, every day of seeing that of 150 homes or a thousand homes that are burned in your community where as a firefighter, your goal is to protect protect property, save lives, you know, and fortunately, remarkably, the, the, life, the lives lost during this was, um, you know, exquisitely low, um, only two people, but uh, I still think that day to day, um, people see this in their community, they drive through a community that is that is absolutely burned, um, and that does play a role. And you have to continually think about that for those folks that that responded to that, that were involved in it, that maybe had life-threatening events during it, um, and we're just very remarkably, you know, fortunate to not have lost a firefighter, not to have lost a, a healthcare provider during this. Um, yeah. And it's just a testament to to those that did have their, their homes burned, and we know that did happen for a lot of healthcare workers um, and police officers too, that uh, they, did, they did the job regardless and that their house was burning down. That, that's a remarkable feat. It's not a, it's not a silo, it's not like it only happened here, but it's just another um, remarkable aspect of, of what uh, first responders, healthcare workers, healthcare professionals do. It's, it's a testament to um, their willingness to do what they can for their patients. Yeah, we did have to deal with a bunch of that too. I mean, you know, I mean, it's it's very hard. You know, I mean, there was so much good firefighting that had gone on, and and so many houses and buildings that were saved, and all of that stuff. But you know, it's really hard to feel good about that good work when you know a thousand homes burned down, and you know you're driving in, and it's all your friends and neighbors, and you're just you know it's just devastating. And so yeah, it was it was uh, definitely uh, challenging for for our crews to have to work through that. Um, but I think this was a, a good testament to um, community involvement. Um, there was there was not one resources that took over and said we're doing it this way. Everybody worked together. You know, um, I, I I can't say enough of you know the work that that Mark did. He just showed up. Jason just showed up. PJ, you know, running right the incident command, keeping us attested to what's going on. Um, everybody just worked so well together at a moment's notice. Um, I mean, we, we do trainings and stuff like that, but not to this extent. Um, this was literally the definition of worst case scenario. 
and um, because we just all, what can I do, what do you need me to do mentality is I think what really helped all of this come to fruition and it, and it works so well. Yeah, the relationships were key for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, having done those exercises, having worked on, you know, creating, you know, MCI plans and other disaster related plans and then exercising on those plans and, you know, knowing, knowing people and knowing, you know, who to call when you needed them was, yeah, I mean, it was definitely helped win the day for sure. Yeah, I think, I think that's an important feature and maybe for people who aren't from here watching this, um, you know, Denver always seems to me like a big, small town. Um, you know, it, it's got a large population, but everybody kind of knows each other. Um, people, you know, you know, we, we work together all the time in, in, you know, crossing from different parts of the industry, um, you know, different jurisdictions and stuff. Everyone kind of knows each other um, and, and, and is on, you know, a first name basis with most of the other people um, in, in, in their realm. And I think that that makes a big difference that, that really, you know, and then specifically that this neighborhood in this area, this is, you know, the northeast side of, uh, northwest side of town, it is also a very, very much as a, a, a community in a small town feel. It doesn't yeah. feel like it's a bedroom community of a bigger place and nobody really knows each other because they just, you know, don't interface. Like, it, mm-hmm. it, it, that, that kind of came out. And that certainly comes out in just in EMS and in fire and in, and in healthcare that, you know, we all kind of know each other. Mm-hmm. And, and that makes it easier to work with people because you know each other. Yeah. And, and, and it also makes it more rewarding to work with each other because you're kind of helping your friends out when they need help. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so when we realized that we were gonna need to find placement for a large volume of patients coming out of Good Samaritan Medical Center, we immediately contacted and resourced our first call uh, center, which is our communication center for, at, at the time, SCL Legacy. Um, and that is essentially a number where if you're at any emergency department, certainly within our system, but even outside, you can call that number and we can facilitate, they can facilitate, Barb, Jamie, and her team, um, identifying, locating beds within our system and even outside of our system if we would need to find uh, critical care beds, acute care beds. Um, and so with that one call, or our first call, program, we are able to then um, get the resources that we need to move those patients. Uh, We use that standardly in our day-to-day operations, but they became really critical when we needed to find uh, find beds for these patients rapidly. Um, And so it was by working with them that we were able to create that shared that shared spreadsheet and as we were loading the patients in priority for evacuation they at the same time in um, in parallel were then finding locations for them they would let us know that we had a bed at Lutheran or that we had a bed at St. Joe's and so they were really critical to finding spots for our patients in in a short period of time at a time when bed capacity was very 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 low it was very tight um, Abby, the, and also the thing to mention for first call, it's important again for people from out, who are watching this from outside the system. First call is physically located at Lutheran Hospital, mm-hmm. so they were not the within the they were not within the the Good Samaritan Hospital facility or affected by that. So that they are, that that facility is actually outside um, and, and relatively unaffected, um, mm-hmm. which is helpful because if they were based at Good Sam, the first call center would be evacuated along with everybody else and it would have compromised that resource. Really good point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Really good point. But they were critical. Mm-hmm. Yes. All right, well, as we look to wrap this up, why don't we take a minute and maybe run down the table and tell our viewers some of our most important lessons learned, something that they can take away from this. So I think one of the important things about uh, responding to any major incident like this is is remembering all of the experiences that you have that you're bringing to that incident. You have life experience, you have job experience, um, you have professional education, all of those things wrapped up into a ball coming with you for that response. But there's typically some sort of black and white textbook answer to what you're going to be doing or what you should be doing. 
that textbook black and white answer may not be the best thing for that day. There may be more success in the gray. Um, and the idea of calling a dispatch center that's not the one that's involved in the ICS structure, um, those kind of things can really be major successes, but they're not going to be found in the textbook. They're not going to be found in the black and the white. They're going to be found in the gray. And that's something to um, remember amongst all of the experiences that you're bringing with you to that incident. No, Mark, I, th I think that's great, and it's also the fluidity. Um, you have to be able to move and adapt um, to any type of situation that's uh, going on right now. You can't be static in the way you think things should be done or the way things have been done in the past. Um, no situation is ever going to be the same again. So you've got to be able to take your resources that you think that, that you need and take the resources that you have and make them work together. Um, it's not always um, you have product A and, and, and you have a resource for product A, sometimes you've got to cross, cross those a little bit um, because at the end of the day, getting the goal done is the ultimate, um, is what you're really trying to achieve. Um, not how you get it done, just the fact that you get it done, period, um, in the best way possible, I think is a, is, a, is a key point from this whole situation. Yeah, and I think those are all really great points, absolutely. I would certainly advise anyone that's watching this that could potentially be involved to practice, you know, to call up your incident command teams and practice. Um, and in the absence of that, really, because these things happen so fast, you don't have time to set it up and make it perfect, but really just make sure that you uh, communicate with your teams and that you understand what your objectives are and then trust your teams to, um, to really operationalize those objectives. Um, I think that from uh, my perspective as a physician, and I think it also will broaden out to other, other uh, jobs and other roles, is that a lot of the things that made me able to be somewhat useful that day um, came from the things that I do that are outside of my defined role. And so I think it's very easy and it's, and it's almost essential even for a lot of people after the pandemic and the stresses they've been under to just focus on the absolute essentials of the job to get through the day. But I think that when you're looking at your job every day, there are things, there are opportunities where you can build relationships with people who are outside of the traditional role or get involved in organizations that are outside of that. Because you know, most of the stuff that I was doing that day had very little to do with what would be you know, typical role of an emergency physician or even the typical role of an EMS physician, but had much more to do with um, uh, the, the relationships and the work that I had done being involved with these organizations and being involved with the fire departments and EMS agencies and knowing the people and, and having those relationships, that, that allowed me to be um, useful that day in a way that if I had just taken a very strict definition of what my job is, I, I don't think I would have had those skills. And so I think that you know one way to prepare is just how you approach everyday work and how you interact with people who are you know outside of your direct role. Um, I think that that has a great deal of value and it, and it paid off that day, mm -hmm. you know, I, I feel, again, it f I feel like it allowed me to be, to be more useful than I could have been that day. Really good thoughts. Yeah, and I would echo kind of a similar idea. Um, one would be, you, you know, for me it was relationships, you know, kind of won the day, right? Um, being able to uh, solve problems but have the relationships to do it. You know, if incident command tells you, hey, you know, we, we don't think we can get you those ambulances, no problem, I got four other ways to solve that problem, right? I can contact the healthcare coalition, I can, you know, like mm -hmm. being able to to have those relationships pre-developed was was key. Um, the other big point that I would uh, lean, to, you know, point everybody to is is sort of the idea of sort of trusting the person on the ground. Um, you know, that was a that was kind of a, a big one for me. You know, when they called and they said, "Hey, we, you know, we want to evacuate a Vista," and I, you know, kind of laughed and was like, "Oh no, I, th I think we're good there." You know, but then but then when they called back and they said, "No, hey, it's Chris Malliard, and he's saying we need to evacuate a Vista," it was kind of like okay, like, I understand, I trust Chris, I've worked with Chris, like, if they're saying they need to evacuate, they need to evacuate. And then, you know, being able to just snap into that decision quickly. Um, so, you know, just that idea of trust the person that's there, that's seeing everything that, that is, that is, you know, really living it. Yeah. As we wrap things up, um, one of the things that you at home, you know, can take away from this is that with the training that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, the relationships that we build um, through those trainings and just our day-to-day -day interactions with each other allowed us to just um, get this whole situation to work. 
Um, without those um, interoperability communications, working relationships, um, it really wouldn't have been so easy. So with those trainings that you're doing, you know, monthly, yearly, quarterly that you're doing um, within your organization and other organizations really does help. And um, for us, we're glad that we did. Well, that concludes our panel um, for the Marshall Fire Learning Session, the hospital and EMS panel. I'd like to thank you all for your um, open, honest conversation, and I hope that you all took something away from it. Take care of yourselves.